Welcome back to SuperCloud, our fourth SuperCloud. And with me is my colleague and friend, Stu Miniman, Senior Director of Market Insights with Red Hat. And of course, former superstar on theCUBE, Stu, good to see you again. Hey, Dave, doing, great man? to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, you're welcome. So SuperCloud um, is happening in Palo Alto on October 24th. Of course, this is a pre-record. We're going to drop this into the stream. Uh, as you know, it's a live event. Uh, and then people come into the studio, all of, you know, friends of, of the Cube, local Palo Alto people, and, uh, and we get the ecosystem speaking. So let's speak. So, you know, the theme here is AI and transformation of industries. Uh, but let's go back to the beginning, because you and I have, you know, you don't love the term super cloud, you know. But, but you know, we talk about multi-cloud complexity. What are you seeing out there? Is it still largely mono cloud with a little bit of peripheral stuff that, you know, by whatever, M&A or happenstance? Or is there really a multi-cloud trend happening? Yeah, so, so you know, Dave, I, I have an aversion to terms sometime just because, you know, I've got the scars from all the battles of nobody liked the term cloud. Um, and when you talked like hybrid cloud or multi-cloud, what does that really mean? Big so, data. You know, when I talk to you, Dave, like I talk to a lot of customers. What's the reality today? Change is constant. They have stuff in their data center, they have stuff in colos, they're using more than one public cloud, and of course, AI is making things even more distributed because the edge is even more important. So applications are definitely distributed, um, and when it comes to the use of cloud, um, there's this interesting dynamic that you need to have. On the one hand, the reason I go to a specific public cloud isn't to get the cheapest compute at volume, it's They've got hundreds of cool services that I want to take advantage of, but the more you take advantage of proprietary services, the more you are you know, stuck on what they're doing. So I want to take advantage of things, but I also want to have the flexibility to be able to use, uh, you know, a year ago if I was making a plan, to, oh, I wasn't thinking about OpenAI and where Microsoft is, and Google and Amazon are constantly building new, new things. So most customers have multiple clouds. They're still figuring out how much do I use those services and make them specific to an environment versus like what we've been working on Red Hat, you know, since the early days is, you know, first we put Linux in all the clouds and then we put, you know, OpenShift our Kubernetes in all the clouds in the data center and out at the edge to give you that consistent experience everywhere. So it's a balance because containers actually allow you to take advantage of a lot of those underlying capabilities as opposed to like the generation before of PaaS was, I can sit on top of environments, but it, it, I kind of got least common denominator if I was using those other services. So you want best of breed, yeah. okay? But the developer wants, to the extent possible, a consistent experience, he or she, you know, doesn't want to have to have a different experience to secure the cloud uh, or, or deploy in the cloud. Of course, that's often the case. Or what about compliance? These are all, or, or single sign-on and identity and so forth. Those are all sort of different. But but AI, you know, the AI heard around world, the heard around the world, as I say sometimes, created a real rush to best of breed, which has really been open AI and, and Microsoft. Yeah, and Dave, I'm glad you brought up that developer experience. You know, what we hear from the developer community so much is developers have cognitive overload. And how can I get somebody ramped up faster to do what they need? And we used to talk, you know, our, our friend Brian Gracely used to say, um, you know, if I have somebody, a developer working on one cloud that they've worked on for years, if that's what they're doing, and all of a sudden you say, hey, I need you to go work on this other environment. It might be easier to switch jobs <laughs> yeah. and you know keep on my stack than it is to go there. Um, open stack, uh, open shift that, that that we offer helps with that environment. But the other another big trend that's been happening is that whole platform engineering discussion where I want to be able to build the golden path uh, for my uh, developers, um, help make sure they have access to all, all of the pieces of tooling that they want, um, and that should be able to live in multiple uh, clouds and multiple environments. Explain platform engineering and where it evolved from and what, what, what problem does it solve? Explain that for me. Yeah, uh, it, it, great question. So, you know, a lot of th times we look at this and we say platform engineering sounds a lot like DevOps. And okay. we'd had more than a decade of DevOps where it, a lot of that was the philosophy of how we build things. So I go from waterfall to agile to, you know, bringing dev and ops together. The re reality for most customers is you still have somebody who needs to have the operations of an environment and somebody does the developer. Amazon themselves actually has the person that builds it, runs it, but you know, Amazon is a special environment. For most companies, you want to simplify operations. So that is where the platform engineering 
I treat the platform like a product, like many companies actually have a product manager running that that says, here's what I define, here's the interfaces that you have, we can give you t-shirt sizes of, of, of how to do things, and therefore when you come in with a project, I have you know, a portal that I can go into. Uh, in the cloud native space, there's a very popular project called Backstage, which came out of Spotify, that helps in that environment. We've been working in that space, uh, Red Hat, uh, for about a year now to help simplify that and allow companies to take access to it. So again, it's really making simpler that platform piece uh, and developers will then be consumers uh, of that environment. So it's a little overlap with what I used to do with DevOps. Um, it si sounds a little bit to something like SRE, but SRE usually is running a service. So they ha don't just have the platform, but they're running the applications themselves. So that's kind of the, the hopefully a simple explanation to, to help with the whole platform discussion. Thank you for that. And, and, and I want to I want to bring it back to, to AI. It's kind yeah. of the theme here. And I don't know if you saw, we published the, the Cube Power Law. Um, so the Cube Power Law sort of take a page out of uh, the old music business where, where you've got very few uh, uh, music labels yep. basically own the market. And yeah. there's this long tail. And we're saying, oh yeah, there's a similar dynamic here, but the difference is on the chart. And we, we've shown the chart a number of times this week. So, but, uh, but for Stu's benefit, we're saying open source is pulling that torso up. Yep. And the other thing we're saying is you've got the big monster, open AIs, Amazon, Vertex AI from Google, et cetera, are the consumer you know, giants, uh, maybe not so much as Amazon, but big, big LLM. So it's the, it's the size of the model on the vertical axis and the model specificity on the horizontal axis and you got this big long tail. Kind of makes sense, right? But so my question is, are, when you talk to customers, are they talking about actually, I mean, most of the actions in the cloud today, but are they talking about doing stuff on-prem because they're concerned about, well, that's where the data is and that's where I, I'm worried about IP leakage. Of course, the edge, very clearly AI inference is going to happen at the edge. What are you hearing from customers just in terms of how they're deploying AI and where they're thinking about yeah, it? Yeah, so, so Dave, I, I talk to customers in a lot of industries, but when I talk to my FSI customers, you know, the financials, yep. the banks, the, uh, the insurance companies, absolutely they're concerned about their data and they are, they are the ones that, are they using public cloud? Yes, but they'll say, let me take an open AI and let me train it on my data in my, you know, in my firewall and under my control so that everything that I'm doing is there. I'm, I'm sure you've seen it, like every enterprise has put out the, you know, don't put your proprietary yeah. data <laughs> into chat GPT. Some people have ignored uh, that. Know, things like that <laughs> because um, <laughs> you, you want to be really careful there. So absolutely, um, yes, yeah, so, you know, we, we see that they are going to want it uh, under their governance, under their guardrails. Uh, for, for that kind of environment so that they, that they can do what they want. So one of the big themes, again, of SuperCloud 4 is this sort of industry transformation, the impact of AI. So you mentioned financial services. I feel like financial services, they're pretty astute technically, yeah. right? So they're going to, and they've, they've got a lot of data. You know, of course you saw, you know, crypto for a while looked like it was going to disrupt FinTech um, or financial services. FinTech is sort of a, still a buzzword, but it, it seems like the, the big banks are just so big, they can sort of co-opt everything. So maybe maybe financial services gets disrupted more by increased interest rates than it does by, by tech. But are you seeing, it seems to me like manufacturing with all the geopolitical tensions that's going on with the US and China and, and, and move toward India or onshoring, move toward you know, autonomous, the manufacturing, I mean, the, uh, the, the automobile industry, you know, you've, track Tesla for a, for a while, as have we. You're seeing how that's sort of disrupting automotive, you know, although all the, the manufacturers are sort of leaning that way. What are you seeing in terms of industry transformation, industry disruption, any patterns that emerge when you talk to customers? Yeah, and, and it's interesting. When you think about data, remember a number of years ago, Dave, it felt like we talked about GDPR constantly. Yeah. Um, these days, every time I talk to Europe, uh, it's sovereignty. Mm -hmm. um, so every country wants, the data staying in their country, and that's been a big shift when you talk about how I think about my data and you know the power of AI should be the more data I have access to and be able to train on. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious how uh, will sovereignty be pushing against uh, the, the, the trend of AI? Will that shift what, what's happening there? Um, because yeah, like 
AI absolutely is, you know, mega trend, um, should disrupt uh, a number of industries, and we're, every company is trying to figure out exactly how they take advantage of it. It's interesting, if, if you saw, from, you know, from Red Hat, you know, one of the first pieces we have, our Ansible automation team has, uh, you know, how do we build Ansible playbooks easily just typing in with, you know, natural language um, and it spits out. And underneath that is the LLM, which our friends at IBM are doing. And underneath that actually is OpenShift. So OpenShift is the infrastructure for that. So when I think about super cloud, when I think about, you know, large language models, you know, we're an underpinning layer for that just because the platform that we've built, containers, Kubernetes, scalability, automation, uh, can actually live in a lot of these environments. And AI has been a great workload for us, and this should be a great tailwind for us and uh, in, in this uh, in the And the data, the spending data from ETR, I still see a lot of OpenStack, and yeah. that's, that's about sovereign cloud, right? I mean, yeah. Walmart's one of our guests. I don't think it's a probably, you know, they, they have enough resource to do their own open source, you know, uh, development, but their triplet model has OpenStack on-prem yeah. and they use Google and Azure. Funny, they don't use Amazon, but. Uh, it, it, yeah, Dave, I, you know, I've, 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 I've talked to Walmart. You and I did, yeah. did, did a cube gig once yep. and like they used to have two main environments, OpenStack and global ZOS. Yep. So yeah, they're using their mainframes there and they do a lot of containers, uh, you know, lots of Linux in that environment. So yeah, uh, Walmart's always an interesting one. And of course they, they don't use Amazon because the right. retail yeah, competition. Right. You can't blame yeah. them. <laughs> and then, and then <laughs> talk about disruption. And then we have another guest uh, on uh, this week uh, from, from SEMA AI. They basically do uh, a system on chip, ML system on chip, all about the edge. So they're doing, you know, autonomous, they're doing robots, very low power, um, extremely, you know, strong performance per watt metrics. And you know where we stand on, on ARM-based, you know, systems and the disruption. So that whole edge story is really, I think, going to explode. I mean, it's the semiconductor content on edge today, you know, these sort of, you know, edge-like applications is like $40 billion. I mean, it's enormous. I mean, you know, vehicles and so forth. And it's supposedly going to increase by four to five X by the end of the decade. So that's going to trickle in. I, I really feel like that's where the blind spot is going to be in the enterprise. You know, and it's going to disrupt the traditional computing environment. Not that that's going to go away. We don't think it's going to go away, but the general purpose computing environment is going to shrink as a percentage of the total. And you're going to see accelerated computing as, as uh, uh, Jensen likes to call it, or intelligent computing. It's going to be everywhere. Do you agree with that? Do you hear that from customers? Yeah, it's interesting. So we, we, we talk specifically about like, you know, AI for financial services, but financial services aren't the ones that are usually pushing out to the edge. So industrial, right. telecommunications are big use case. Healthcare uh, actually Absolutely, has a, a lot yeah. of interesting use cases. Retail. And, and AI inferencing is something we've seen. When we took, um, we've got an open source project called MicroShift that we're taking, you know, how do we get even smaller uh, than, than Kubernetes? Um, and we've got a big partnership with ABB, who's a robotics company, yep. uh, and Lockheed Martin, who does their, their drones uh, for AI inferencing uh, when, when, when they're in flight. MicroShift, so, it's called? Yeah, that's MicroShift a, a is, is, is the open source project we've had for a number of years. It's been productized with RHEL for Edge and something we call Red Hat Device Edge. Very cool, yeah. so yeah, that's, so that's, you know, a lot going on there in the, in the world of hybrid. So you're in cloud native, public cloud, obviously you're on-prem, you're pushing out to the edge. Yeah. And <laughs> is it a pipe dream that you can have a consistent experience across all of those estates? No, no, Dave, it, okay. it, it, it's a big thing because what's interesting is like, look, we partner really closely with the public cloud providers. If you look at what they've been doing from a hybrid environment, how do they take really their footprint and push it closer and closer? So take AWS, you know, they created wavelengths and local zones right. and then outposts. Um, we can live right on EC2 in AWS and we can actually put our software on all of those other flavors too. So from our standpoint, that same consistent environment, yeah, we can live in the data center and the public cloud and the edge. And when you talk about what the public cloud providers are doing from hybrid, when they put more hardware footprints, the software can just go along with it most of the time. But so. isn't that the same uh, isn't that all Amazon stack that it, it, you just Amazon described? Hardware, but okay. just as I said, just as we, you know, we just live on EC2 in the public cloud. So yes, it's their hardware, but our, we're just another piece of software on top of that stack that they offer. In the public cloud, we're just another native service and we, we can fit in those other environments too. You remember the work we did with true private cloud. Yeah, and yeah, the yeah. whole concept was to substantially sort of cre recreate or create the experience of the public cloud on-prem. Yeah. 
and it's kind of taken a decade yeah. you know, to, to really get there. We were talking about it in 2010 at yeah. VMworld, you remember. Are we there yet? Uh, so a lot of the things, what, what's interesting is I talk about our managed service that we have uh, with AWS. Big discussion point recently has been about, right, what about the data center? So mm -hmm. uh, HPE GreenLake has been making progress for the last few years. Uh, Dell with their Apex program, we announced at Red Hat Summit earlier this year a partnership there. Um, I almost call it, it's like the cloud native next generation of VxRail, which yeah. has been a, a you know a, a real winner uh, in the data center. Oh, right. So yeah. um, you know if we can take that cloud native stack in that kind of footprint, that, that's a huge opportunity. So it's going to be interesting to see how the cloud guys respond to it. All the cloud guys have an edge strategy, yeah. right? And of course they all have AI strategies. Yeah. But you know, we do see this kind of quasi balance equilibrium happening between, you know, people are being sort of more circumspect about where they actually do work. Sort of it was a rush to the cloud during pandemic and now it's like, okay, let's kind of think about where the best economics are where the lowest latency is and you know physics still matter and of course again I think the edge blows this whole thing sky high and it's a, a, a real curveball. Uh, last thoughts too I mean super cloud you know still not bought in to the term but yeah you're, but, but, you, but conceptually yeah Dave I can, I can uh, really you know in, right? if, if I if I zoom out a bit and think about what we have been doing for like the last 20 years, it's really about distributed architectures. I remember talking to Martin Casado, uh, you know, when, yeah. when, when he was with NYSERA pre VMware acquisition, that was the discussion uh, that, that we were having. Um, cloud, while you think about the centralization when we had that pendulum swift of, uh, swing of everybody going to the public cloud, really cloud is very distributed today and customers, you know, we know one of the, the, the laws of IT is nothing ever dies, so they have so many different pieces. Um, we really try to be able to give that consistency for, uh, you know, security teams, for the operations, and developers are so important these days across all of these environments. And absolutely, Edge is a critical uh, place that we're trying to make sure that that consistency is there, but it has to have automation built in, and it has to, you know, I, I'm not going to have the resources, I'm probably not going to have the network connectivity. Um, unfortunately, you know, the laws of physics and, uh, you know, some of the other, yeah, I remember what was Pat Gelsinger's three laws of uh, uh, yeah, that, that we yeah, had, yeah. It, it's even more so um, out at the edge because, you know, I have, I have limited footprint, limited resources, and probably no personnel. And if I do have personnel going out there, they're probably going to be, you know, low skill level. So we, we have to have things that just, you know, are, you know, out of the box, you know, hardened and easily installed and easily managed because yeah. um, otherwise w when we get to fleets of devices or highly distributed, we, we can't take advantage. No truck rolls, yeah. uh, as automated as possible and uh, you know, low maintenance. Uh, Stu, thanks so much for My supporting pleasure. SuperCloud 4. Great to have you, great to see you in studio. Thanks so much, Dave. You're welcome, all right. And keep it right there for more actions from SuperCloud 4 Live from our Palo Alto studio, myself, Rob Streche, John Furrier. Be right back, we're ready for this short break.